And it just, you know, Ugh. and then we're doing this now, like these kind of shows for a year. Now I'm talking to this guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just a very familiar format to me. I'm because kidding of here. with you. <laughs> Bring me a my name is Adam, and this is about you, your journey in music, and we'll talk about your new EP. And I want to hear about this live stream you did on Saturday. That sounded, that looks like it was right. Oh, my, that was pretty cool. Yeah, just uh, looking at the names that are on it, I'm like, wow, that must have been a pretty th cool. I mean, and then the, it's benefiting the crew and the staff and everything else. It must have been something rad to be a part of. Yeah, I love being able to be um, part of something that, you know, gives back to the crew to the crew members, everybody behind the scenes, because I mean, everybody's been hit so hard. But you know, um, I love it that that was like forward, we were dealing with that in particular. So you know, sure. I mean, they're like hit the hardest. I mean, yeah, like you said, everybody yeah, was because, affected, I mean, but that's their was, whole income, right? I mean, yeah, I was able to like, you know, not that I was thriving during the pandemic, but like, you know, at least I could still do my thing. And even though it's, you know, on this platform, I was, I was still able to sing and, you know, so record. Art. but you know, yeah, like, I don't know that that was, you know, that was a devastating blow. So I'm glad that that happened. It was called the Philo Festival, Philo Festival, sorry. And a philo dough, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, there was a, there, just a ton of brilliant artists on it, and um, some of it was live streamed live, some of it was pre-recorded. I did mine from Woodstock uh, for the Woodstock sessions, so wow. um, I did a couple of songs from there. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I, yeah like I said, I just saw I the names on it. it. I'm like, wow, this just happened on Saturday. That's really awesome. Yeah, I know. There was like what, like widespread panic, Bob Weir, Questlove. There was like every. There was Crosby, just like Hag Sammy Hagar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. <laughs> that's so cool. Well, first off, where were you born and raised? I know, I know you're you're in New York now, right? Yeah, I okay. I'm born and raised on Long Island. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, out near Stony Brook. Tell me about that a little bit. <laughs> so much to tell <laughs> it was pretty suburban you know I kind of you know I had a good childhood I got to there were a lot of kids on my street like kickball and you know everybody tackling you know sure. <laughs> a lot of boys and girls my age so it was really fun it was um you know and somewhat painful I remember <laughs> getting like always in fights you know like like pylons <laughs> Like that's the first thing I think of, and especially Dog piles. During, yeah, like, with the kids. Like that doesn't happen anymore. But like, like climbing trees, happens, constantly really hurting though. myself. I was constantly like falling off a bike or falling, you know, like <laughs> covered in blood. But um, yeah, like it was a rough childhood, <laughs> just with other kids. But um, yeah, I just it was pretty normal, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I had a you know. As far as music, my dad was a music teacher, is still a musician. Oh, um, cool. That's what was, yeah, how did, so that's how you got into it, really? I mean, yeah, I dad. think so. I grew up with a piano, and I remember just playing early on. You know, like I would just kind of listen to what was happening on TV or whatever, you know, the radio, and then I'd go run to the piano and kind of start playing. So I had a good year as a kid. So that yeah, was Yeah, trying to mimic kind of what you're hearing on TV. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then I feel like the first few things like the first things I really learned and like deep went uh dove in deep was uh, the Beatles because okay. I, I had this amazing um there was a couple of books uh it was called the complete Beatles and Banton put it out and um if you ever saw it it was like the striped uh bookends and it was this great complete collection volume one and two of every single Beatles song wow. and done beautifully like it was correct and so like I would, that's, I learned a lot of chords like that. Um, and then just between the ear and listening and like learning chords, that's how I feel like I figured out how to play songs. Okay. Didn't take lessons. Just. I did. Oh, okay. I did. But like, you know, that was, it felt like they weren't connected as a kid. Mm -hmm. Like there was songs and then there was like classical music that I didn't want to learn, but I learned it anyway, you know, which is you, good, you know, obviously later on it's helped, but. Um, okay. That was going to be my question is you think it, Cause okay, I have a five year old, right? And he mm -hmm. and we got him a drum kit during this pandemic, but we got him a electric one just because I didn't want to hear him smashing it all day. But it kind of helped get his energy out. But he's he's interested in the piano. My sister, and my dad can both play. I regretted, you know, not doing it. But I would feel like I talked to a lot of people that either say like I'm glad I. Uh, everyone says I'm glad I took lessons. A lot of people are saying like I hated taking lessons because I 
they were forcing me to play all the stuff I didn't want to play. And then some people were like, I had so much fun because I got to play what I wanted to. Do you feel like you really should do the classical stuff? I can't, it can't hurt. You know, okay. I mean, if it, if it, if a kid hates it so much that it, he leaves playing music for it, that's because of it, that's bad. But, you know, ultimately, of course, you know, and, and, you know, classical music is, it's still around because it's just some of the greatest music sure. on the planet ever written. Those melodies, you know, you listen to Mozart. Oh, it's beautiful. I'd love to hear it play, it, you know? but it's so, like. Yeah, it's, it's hard. And kids, <laughs> especially these days, I can't, I mean, it was hard when I was growing up, but even more so now because of everything, all the technology and our short attention spans. It's hard. It's mm -hmm. hard to sit down for a minute and do anything these days so right. i you know if if you can somehow find a way to you know the kids to to find a way to appreciate the time but you know it's a tall order <laughs> right right that's what i was curious just wondering if you can't push but you can encourage okay i like that i like that so you were in it but but dad, what does dad play does he play everything trumpet trumpet but he okay. played a little piano and we used to sit down and um, he was, you know, like as far as playing piano, he wasn't really, he's, he's self-taught and he doesn't really play songs, but he would kind of do these improvisational modes, like beautiful kind of like, and then I would just sit down and we'd improvise for, oh, cool. for, um, I don't, I don't know. It felt like hours. <laughs> Maybe it was like, I don't remember. 20 minutes. <laughs> but, um, you know, as a kid, I just remember these like zones we got into. It was just like really cool. And I, I remember loving that. And he had a great music collection. We had a great stereo system um we had these big jbl speakers and um these a great turntable and just you know so there was there was a lot of music i felt like the music sounded good we had like a, a like a den where we sat and you know we listened to music and um yeah those are good memories so piano, yeah the piano was the first instrument you learned then yeah and i okay. i got a guitar when i was 16 i wanted an acoustic guitar so i got one and i learned that's when i started playing i just uh figured out Again, I took a little bit of classical, but I'm it's, I, I'm not even that, you know, guitar is hard. <laughs> like, it I really just, is. I, it's, I, find, I find it, but I've been playing it more and more. And I just, I, I like, um, that was, you know, because it's so different than piano. So I got to learn more folk music. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, helped my writing, learning gu guitar, you just, know, as far as some of that. Do you I mean, feel like, yeah, well, I guess you just answered my question. If, if you feel like learning the chords on guitar helped your songwriting in the sense that, once you learn all the chords, right, it's, you can pretty much play. Yeah, three anything. chords and the truth. Yeah, right? so it's just, there you go. I mean, it's hard to get, unless you're really, really into guitar, I feel like it's hard to focus on all the scales and the shredding. Yeah, I, I never, <laughs> I never got into that. I'm, uh, but I, but I love learning songs. Again, it's like the same approach as piano. I like to figure out songs. It makes me a better player. Sure. Sure. So 16, you got the guitar. Were you writing before you got the guitar? Yeah, I started writing on piano around 14. Okay. Being like just devastating love songs. I don't know where it came from, but I was definitely um, feeling uh, <laughs> feeling things. Sure, sure. Did you share those songs to anyone? Or yeah, you know, yeah, okay. I did. I, I remember recording them too. Really? Okay. Um, yeah, just like, you know, they were, they were just kind of demos. But, but still, um, do you have those recordings? Probably not. Oh, I didn't know. None of those early songs. Like oh, okay. Okay. Maybe my dad does. I mean, he's got tons of stuff, so maybe. Did you play them for your dad? Oh yeah, yeah. I played them for everybody. Was it? It must be vulnerable to share your lyrics and kind of your emotions with your with your parents. I would think. Yeah, that sucks. But um, <laughs> but like friends at school, you know, I had nothing to lose, and plus I was kind of like you know a dramatic kid, so it was fun. Okay. <laughs> did you play out at all? Or when did you start uh, telling that? I would do open mics, like really? maybe right after high school. When I was uh, like, okay. you know, my first year of college, I, I started doing open and open mics and I joined a band when I was about 19. And then we started playing bars and stuff like, and I did that for a good four years. We had a good run. Our, our, the name of the band was Mother Freedom. And um, we did, you know, we took it as far as it could go. And then around, the, and I guess I was about like 22 when that ended, 23. And that's when I um, I left Long Island. I moved to the city. Okay. And is that where your solo career started or? I guess so. Yeah, I oh, was okay. alone. <laughs> <laughs> We're always striving to be a musician though. Like the band, that was kind of the thing, the prize. Yeah, and, then, and then I think like, you know, I was, I kind of, 
I, I started teaching a little bit. I never feel like in my twenties that being a performer was my main focus. I was kind of like all over the place, you know, I was like, cause the band was such a big part of my life when I was young. And then I was just like, forget it. I don't want this, you know? And then I was thinking like teaching and just doing like a bunch of other things. And then I think like towards my late twenties, I got, you know, when I, I moved in the city, you know, like 25, 26, I started like really start focusing on it again. So then I wound up working with, I met Joel Dorn because I actually recorded a soul. So, okay, let me, let me go back a little bit before okay. that. Um, there was a music, uh, the songwriting group directed by Jack Hardy. Um, he was, uh, he, he started fast folk magazine and he would host a songwriters group every Monday. You'd have to bring like a, like a new song or a song that you were working on to this group. And, you know, a lot of people came from this group too, like Suzanne Vega, Richard Julian, um, wow, Sean names. Colvin, Dar Williams, see like a lot of New York city songwriters. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, sometimes you, they would be there. Sometimes they weren't, you know, it's just local people just, um, working songs out and that really kicked my ass and really helped me. And it was a nice community to be in. Mm -hmm. So that just kind of like gave me, um, some drive there, a little purpose. And then I had a collection of songs and then I went and recorded them. And then from there, I was mastering it at this place called DB Plus, and a guy named Joel Dorn was working there, and he used to run Atlantic Records in the 70s, and he, and he also was a, um, the jazz division, I, I should say, and, and he was like one of the, like the staff producers, like the, one of the head producers there, and he, he produced Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway and Bette Midler and some Dr. John, and so like I met this legend, he was just mm -hmm. like, you know what, kid, I think we can make a record together. You know, like, well, he talked more like that. He had a really <laughs> voice, you know. But he was like, you know what, kid, let's, I think we could make a record. We could do something. I'm like, okay. So we started working together, and that's when I got my deal with Ryko. And, um, and I actually met Kevin Calibro, who, you know, now we're working together because mm -hmm. of the Royal Potato Family through Joel, because he used to work with Joel. So, oh. you know, we didn't work together then, but we did meet. You knew each other. Yeah. So we met because of Joel, we met. Interesting. So was that the record that you worked on with him? Was that that was that your first? Yeah, that was my first debut, label release. Oh, yeah. wow. And was that the you got a Grammy nomination, right? I did that. Oh, my gosh. What a validating moment. Well, the record did. It was up for best engineered. Yeah. But still, I mean, yes, wow, yeah, it was great. Oh, my gosh. Tell me about that. What was it like to get that call? Um, That was cool. You know, <laughs> not not nothing to hear. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, Grammy nominated. Nominated. I mean, whatever. It's only the biggest win. award ever. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. But still, wow. Did that kind of get your name out there a bit more? Having your name um, on that. I'd like to let sure. <laughs> Maybe. Like, I mean, did the shows get bigger or did it like, did you see any direct like effect? Yeah, really? I think one thing always leads to another, you know, um, I don't think there has ever been one break. I think it's just a series of little breaks that kind of lead you to where you are now. Okay. What would you say the next little victory was after that? Um, record came I, out? After that record came out, um, I started working with, um, Robert Rosenberg and Bill Kerbishley who run, um, Trinifold, who managed the Who. Wow. And I moved oh, to okay. That's the Who connection. Years. And I moved to London for a few years and worked over there and toured around there. And that was that was a pretty cool, exciting thing that happened. Wow. Yeah. So did you did, was that the first time you got a tour with the Who? Because I know you done tours. No, with I wasn't Daltrey. actually working with them there. Oh, okay. Um, I was just managed by them, and um, and they just you know they I just did a bunch of touring and writing and and it was just you know living there for a few years i didn't start working with roger i actually i think i sang or co co-wrote a song that wound up on his record or maybe i don't even remember that was like back in 2014 but um it wasn't until like 2016 or 17 i started doing some shows opening for roger and then that ultimately led to me opening for the who in 2019 at madison square garden that's Two crazy times. Yeah, and and then unfortunately with COVID, that shut down. What you're supposed to play more shows with them, right? Yeah. So yeah, in 2020, I mean, it was. It's like annoying. I hate even talking about it because it's like you know I had to, Sorry no, to bring up fine. those past it's memories. Fine. <laughs> no, but like you know, it's, it's a shitty 
thing. But, you know, like people had it so much worse. But just to say, like, you know, we had the record coming out in April. We had the, mm. the rest of the tour with The Who. And I had like the whole summer was like beautiful. I was invited to sing at Carnegie Hall and it just, you know, oh. and then we're doing this now, like these kind of shows for a year. Now I'm talking to this guy. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, it's just a very familiar format to me. I'm because kidding of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, after Swan Feathers was that first record, the nominee, yeah. the Grammy nominated record. The second one was the second record you put out or piece of piece of music was that love and murder was yes, that, that many years yes. later so that okay. was, yeah so it took a few years because of like you know i started a record or i made another record but it never came out it was I, maybe it will one day but i've taken a few songs from there and put them on other things so it's like kind of out there anyway sure um and then 2016 uh I think it came out in 17 though, but I recorded it with Mark Howard. He kind of just cold called me and, and this was, um, so just to back it up a little bit after London, that's when I came back and I met Bob Weir and did a, a bunch of that TRI stuff. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So that was, um, I don't even, oh yeah. So I actually met those guys while living in London because Justin Kreutzmann, Bob, um, Bill Kreutzmann's son who works on documentaries making, you know, he does films and documentaries. Uh -huh was um and he was running the live the the webcasts from tri was in london because he was working with uh p townsend on uh, a documentary so my managers invited him down to my show saying hey we're working with this american why don't you come down and then something weird like they found this thing from like 2010 where i was at relics doing friend of the devil They're like she's a She's deadhead. <laughs> like, yeah. so I hear, I hear in the audience, they're like, "Play Friend of the Devil." I'm like, I'm in London. Like nobody likes the Grateful Dead in England, or like doesn't not likes, but like they're Appreciate just. Them. It's not a thing. Like it <laughs> okay. is, you know. Um, and I was just like, "What?" And and so we met after. He's like, you know, you you know, we're. I I think you'd be perfect for one of our you know singer song. We invite singer songwriters to come and sing. We could do Grateful Dead stuff. We do your stuff, and you know, you sing with Bob, and we do a great band. I'm like, yeah, count me in. I'd love it. And then Bob heard the version. He invited me, and oh, you know, okay. that's I when I met Bob. Where was the one that yelled to play the song out? No, 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 oh, no, no, like, no, no, no. Justin, been nerve -wracking. Justin <laughs> no, 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 no. He wasn't in London. No, it was it was Justin who was in the audience of my Got show. Got it. And him and Chris were like, you know, there, and so they invited me to TRI the following year, and um. And that started my relationship with, um, I met Dave Schools and, and Steve Kimmock and uh, Jay Lane and then Jason Crosby, who I knew from Long Island, we met up again. So we've always been friends, which is, okay. um, you know, great. And so that, that started that thing. And then, so after that, I started making a record, uh, Mark Howard called me up and he, he's produced like some of my favorite records. He did Lucinda Williams world without tears. He also worked with Daniel M. Watt for like 20 years as his engineer. And, you know, so he's, and he did a bunch of stuff with Emmy Lou Harris. And so he, I don't know, he, he heard me somehow and, and said, you know, I'd love to make a record with you. So we wound up making love and murder in a few days in Topanga Canyon at this house and um and it was just kind of a stripped down solo record especially coming from swan feathers which was kind of like big there's yeah. kind of a lot of stuff on that right. record so this Are was sure? pretty stripped down this is like and you know we had a song called murder me which he really loved and he's like i think you know that's kind of the template for this record so it was like my murder ball ballad album and then so hence love and murder <laughs> okay I mean, aside from working with those incredible people on that record, was there another like milestone you can remember from it? Oh, besides like, all those like great things I just told you, you mean? No, I, I no, no. That's what I mean. Like everything. Like as far as like, like what was the next victory? I mean, aside from putting the record out, then it's like okay, I have this amazing piece of work. I guess we toured. You know. Okay. Again, it was just like like I keep saying these like little things that just keep happening. Sure. Like you know. Um, that that led to oh I, I also did a record with steve kimmock after that that um that uh dave schools produced wow that we toured a bunch with kimmock and that was cool we went to japan and um did you ever played japan prior to that oh no. <laughs> no there you go there's another milestone right that there. was amazing yeah. i know i'm just thinking i'm just drinking my coffee <laughs> i'm there getting there go. um yeah so and then that led to you know just wanted to make another record so in 2018 we started writing again and 2019 we uh re recorded 
if you can't say anything nice and then uh-huh. came out 2020 in april <laughs> Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. So we decided you, to put it out. We're like, I was just going to ask it, you that. Was, you know? So it, I'm sure there was a thought to say, hey, what's we should we hold this? We didn't know no. how long things were going to last, and I was already doing a lot of stuff on this format, and it seemed to be working. So we're like, well, let's just put out the music. But because I didn't get to do the band versions, because this was it, it is a rock and roll record, or a lot of it is. Uh huh. I started rethinking the um, arrangements and stripping them down so I could play them by myself in my you know, room. And that's what led to, in the meantime, oh, putting out okay. an EP of stripped down songs from If You Can't Say Anything Nice plus some covers. Okay. Yeah. So just that, yeah, obviously you had a yeah, kind was of the inspiration. Yeah, yeah, that was the inspiration behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you don't want to relive the trauma of what, you know, happened with 2020 as far as <laughs> still living kind of, it somehow. Yeah, sure, like coming <laughs> crashing down. Um, but how quickly into it did you decide to say, you know what, this is cool. I really like what I'm doing with these stripped back versions. Let's put a record out. Well, uh, I think that summer. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did it for Bandcamp, I think in July. So I probably record, I was started to record them and like, you know, it didn't take too long. So it probably took a couple of weeks just to get them together. So you know, uh, May or June, we recorded it and then put it out in July. And then we were putting it out on Bandcamp, but just recently we decided to release them on Spotify and all the down the platforms. You can download it, so now you can listen to it. Okay. What Anywhere you it? stream music. Why did you leave it on Bandcamp only in the beginning? To make some money. There you go. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> wasn't yeah. Really making much, you know, from all the touring being canceled. So Bandcamp was doing a really cool thing where all the proceeds were going directly to the artists, you know. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't realize they did that. Yeah. So that was that was the inspiration for that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And then were you doing a bunch of live stuff or live yeah, streams to doing a lot support of live the record? I feel like I was doing like two, two or three a month, you know, like um, if, you know, like relics had something or, or live for live nation or, uh, you know, like they, like a bunch of um, organizations, especially that summer. I mean, there was so much going on politically, mm-hmm. um, you know, everything that was going on with black lives matter and, and the election. I feel like there was always something to rally behind. Mm -hmm. So that was, it was such, it was, it was, even though we were home, there was so much going on. So there was a lot, lot to play for Mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. And then as stuff behind and rally behind, Mm -hmm. were you able to uh, start working on anything new or were you basically just trying to focus on, on what you had already kind of written and hadn't got out to the world yet? Was there, did any of that strike up any like emotions to write more? No, I was really struggling to be honest with writing. I didn't really feel that inspired to work on things. It took mm-hmm. me a while to like finally like shake it off. I'm like, all right, start working on stuff. So now I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't I, know. I, and I, I don't think a lot of people that say similar things where it's like it was, you're not really inspired if you're at home. No, I was. I was. You know, I was. It was, it was, it was tough. I mean, I'm not, it wasn't horrible, the whole experience, you know, um, right. but it was, it was, it was tough, but you know, I, I feel like at some point I, I, I just, you know, you, you can only be like that for so long. And it, you know, for me, it was just like, I, I, I needed just to like, at least try. <laughs> so it's, it's um it, now, now it's starting to happen a little bit more. So I have a collection of some new songs. Finally. <laughs> Finally. Yes. Um, wow. Um, well, now that stuff's opening up a little bit, I mean, how does it feels really good to play out? I'll tell uh-huh. you. There's Have you had a chance to be outside it. in front yeah. of people yet? Okay, tell yeah. me about that. I've done a bunch of stuff. So um earlier this year there was a place called the Falcon up in Marlboro, and they were doing really good. It was inside, but it was really well 
aerated, yes, socially yes. distanced, ventilated, or, you know, they were, um, you know, it, it felt good in, to be inside. Like, and I, everybody was masked. I wasn't, you know, I was in the back. Um, and then all, you know, then people started, you know, as the vaccine kicked in people, you know, less mask when you're sitting down, you know, like at a restaurant. Right. Yeah. It starts um, so that start, it starts to feel more comfortable. You know, at first I'm like, what am I doing? And I'm like, welcome to my super spreader event. <laughs> You know, like I'm trying to be smart about it, but you're like, what am I doing right now? But um, knock on wood, it was all good. And, but now like stuff is outside as well and doing like some backyard parties and little festivals and shows outside. So, and then, and starting next month, I'm actually hitting the road and I got some shows upstate in Albany, like at the Linda I'm playing on the 14th of August and stuff um, up up on, in the Northeast. And then I'm out sorry excuse me in the in the midwest like from chicago to i'm so i ohio to chicago like and and around there and in, in uh later on in the month in august amazing i'm sure you that can, feels and good. if anybody wants to check out my dates it's easy you could just go to leslie com. cool um and i'm sure that feels good to finally get out and after a year and a half of sitting it feels around great your hand, being in front of people because sure. everybody's just like ready for it and so it's it's great that's so cool well thank you so much uh leslie for for chatting with me today i really oh, appreciate it happy to i have one more question for you i want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists um <laughs> inspiration it's uh sometimes it's hard to find but like it's there you know i just i i don't have any advice i'm always looking for inspiration myself you know trying to feel like there's you know it's there's a big world out there and there's people and everybody's ready to like hear music and and get back into it so it's it's a good time right now mm -hmm. to get connected Bring me the back road.